All right, welcome everybody. Today's lecture is going to be about basic brain waves and uh, sleep stages. Uh, just as a little precursor, no, I am not a sleep doctor, but I did go to medical school, and some of the stuff here that I'm going to present is uh, some of the basic findings that I found during my studies and uh, when I was exploring around on the internet. Um, some of the brain wave patterns I collected on Wikipedia, and uh, let's begin. Uh, brain waves can be detected by electroencephalography, also known as EEG, and uh, the brain waves d differ depending on the state of awakeness. So uh, your brain waves while you're awake differ from brain waves while you're asleep. Here's an alpha wave. Uh, in the little diagram here, it shows some of the alpha waves. Notice uh, it is at an 8 to 12 hertz pattern. Um, and I'm actually going to skip to the next slide really quick. Don't don't look at the text. Just look at the picture on the next slide. This is beta waves. Notice how they're closer together. So I'm going to go back to alpha now. So the alpha waves are spread out a little more than those beta waves were. Um, this is at about an 8 to 12 hertz pattern. And you'll see alpha waves when you're awake. And I say awake in the relaxed state um, with your eyes closed you'll see a different brainwave pattern with your eyes open and when you're actively thinking. So if your eyes are closed, you're kind of just laying there relaxed, uh, you'll be in a state of alpha wave uh, brain activity. Also note uh, that alpha waves are prominent over the occipital and parietal areas of the brain. Uh, let's move on to beta waves now. Beta waves differ from alpha waves as in they're closer together, meaning they have a higher frequency. And you'll see beta waves at about a 13 to 30 hertz ratio. Um, and again, while the alpha waves were in the awake state when you're awake but with your eyes closed, beta waves are now going to be with your eyes open. And uh, you'll see beta waves when you're actively thinking about a process. So right now I'm thinking about giving a lecture, so right now I'm in a state of beta wave uh, brain function. Um, also, to note, it is best seen over the frontal region of the brain. Let's move on to theta waves. Uh, theta waves, you can see that these are even more spaced out. So while alpha were 8 to 12, 8 to 13 hertz, uh, theta waves are going to be a lot less hertz, so 4 to 7, meaning they're more spread out. Uh, theta waves are predominantly seen in the first beginning stages of sleep. Um, which is typically a lighter sleep. So right when you go to bed um, and you feel that jerk or myoclonic uh, jerk or um, active hallucinations as well, uh, that will indicate stage one sleep. You'll be in predominant theta wave sleep. Uh, there are different subtypes. I'm not going to cover them. Those are That's way too deep. Let's move on to delta waves now. Delta waves are going to be the least frequent wave uh, with a 0.5 some some sources I found said 0 to uh, 3.5 hertz um, 0 would be a fl flat line um, so I, I included the 0.5 one uh, notice how they're high amplitude they're low frequency but high amplitude waves um, and de delta waves you'll see delta waves in the deepest stages of sleep that are non REM sleep uh, so that would be like stage 3 sleep all right, so now I, I've kind of alluded to the sleep stages already. Um, you'll see alpha, beta, theta, and de delta waves uh, all in these stages of sleep. And now let's actually talk about what these stages of sleep are. Um, you do have three main stages, stage one, sleep, stage two, and stage three, three being the deepest, one being the lightest sleep. And you transition from step to step. So you always start in one, then go to two, then go to three. And then the final stage of sleep is going to be the most interesting, and that's known as rapid eye movement sleep, also known as REM sleep. So let's talk about stage one. Stage one, uh, you actually don't spend too much time in this stage. Um, I, I think a source I found was 5%. Uh, not very important, but it is of note to note that you're uh, transitioning from the alpha waves of active um, awakeness to the theta waves, which indicate you're entering into stage one sleep. You're actually falling asleep now. And I've already said that hypnic jerks uh, may indicate onset of stage one sleep. So that's the feeling of, I mean, I, I, I've at least experienced it. I'm pretty sure everybody has when you're going to sleep and 
maybe like you're falling off a cliff, all of a sudden you'll jerk. Or if, uh, if you're married and you're sleeping next to your partner and you feel them twitch or jerk, that, that would indicate that, yes, they are entering into stage one sleep. Stage two sleep. Uh, this is a little different. It's You're transitioning. You always go from step one to step two, so now we're in step two. Uh, this is the stage that you'll see bruxism, and that's uh, teeth grinding. Um, you also have two different patterns that appear, and that's going to be sleep spindle patterns and K complexes. These are actually kind of interesting. Um, they're always unique to stage two sleep. So if, if you're ever asked a question on what, what stage of sleep do you see K complexes, it's always going to be stage two sleep. So the sleep spindles, as you can tell, are going to be Let's see if I can move a mouse here. Yeah. Here's uh, stage two sleep spindles. This is going to be uh, increased or a burst of oscillatory brain activity, as indicated by the, the increased frequency here, meaning that the, uh, the waveforms are closer together. Um, also note, you have K complexes over here. K complexes are going to be larger waveforms. Um, they, the sources that I've found kind of said that they th are thought to be uh, memory consolidation aids. Um, again, sleep is so so subjective to interpretation that this is just the current current belief right now. So let's move on to stage three sleep. Uh, while stage one sleep was predominantly theta waves, now we're moving into the more delta waves. So um, delta waves are going to be the lowest frequency they're going to be associated with the deepest sleep. Also to note, stage three sleep is important because, let's see if I can get a mouse here, sleepwalking here. Uh, sleepwalking is going to be during stage three sleep. Uh, don't confuse that with REM sleep. Um, we'll talk about that next. Stage three sleep is where you're going to get your sleep terrors, your bedwetting, your sleep talking, your sleep walking, uh, some of the stuff that uh, may appear uh, scary to other people uh, is associated with this level. Uh, to contrast this, sleep walking, sleep talking, bedwetting, sleep tears, your, your muscles aren't really inhibited. Um, your muscles are working just fine in sleep walking. Uh, let's look at REM sleep. REM sleep is going to be exactly opposite. Um, you're going to be paralyzed for the most part. And, and if you move down, let's see, one, two, three, four, five bullet points to the loss of motor tone. Uh, this is this loss of motor tone is where you're gonna you're gonna be paralyzed pretty much. Uh, you lose postsynaptic alpha motor neuron inhibition, um, virtually paralyzing you. Except to note, uh, your lungs. I mean, your heart, of course, isn't gonna be paralyzed. And there are a couple other muscles of the body that aren't gonna be paralyzed. But but one muscle to note is your eye movements. Uh, your eye movements will not be paralyzed, and that henceforth the name, the rapid eye movement sleep. Uh, REM sleep. REM sleep actually looks like the awake state. Um, this is this is kind of important because on brainwave uh, monitoring on your EEG, you're gonna appear to be in an awake state. Um, however, you're actually in a dreaming state. This is where your dreams uh, you can remember them when you have these awesome dreams or terrible dreams, depending on what kind you have. Uh, this is the this is the stage of sleep that you're gonna you're gonna remember those dreams for the most part. Um, the eye movements, like I said, rapid eye movements. Your eyes are not going to be paralyzed, and the movements are going to be a burst of eye movement, like like kind of like a twittering. I know you can't see my eyes right now, but um, it'd be kind of like a almost an a nystagmus or um, a ra rapid eye movement sleep. I, just like the name suggests. And this is due to the pontine geniculate occipital spikes, uh, areas within the brain that can contribute to the eye movements. Um, REM sleep accounts for about 25% of the total sleep time. Um, like I said, stage one sleep, you don't, you don't spend much time in that. Uh, REM sleep is going to be where you spend a good amount of your time uh, in sleep. Um, also, uh, you have an irregular heart rate and respiration. Sorry, I'm going out of order, but you have irregular heart rate and respiration rate. Um, that, that's just another thing that I've kind of stumbled upon. Uh, the, the thing that I would star in this slide would be the uh, erections, the clitoral and penile erections. Um, also, you'll have increased brain oxygen consumption. Your brain is 
your brain is active, you're thinking, um, you're dreaming, so your brain is being used more uh, than the other stages of sleep. And then also of note, uh, acetylcholine is the main neurotransmitter uh, of REM sleep. While I don't have it here, norepinephrine is the main uh, neurotransmitter of non-REM sleep. And non-REM sleep includes stage one, two, and three. So pretty much all the stages that are not REM. All right, let's move on. Circadian rhythm. Uh, circadian rhythm uh, is determined by pretty much your suprachiasmic nucleus. So I, I kind of indicated that it's king. Uh, your suprachiasmic nucleus is located in your hypothalamus. And the environment really kind of kind of regulates your suprachiasmic nucleus. Um, so if when it's light during the day, the light cycles, when it's light during the day, dark at night, light at day, dark at night, um, that's really going to create a rhythm, your circadian rhythm. And it's going to cause your uh, hypothalamus, specifically this nucleus, to release norepinephrine. And that norepinephrine is going to act upon the pineal gland, which is located in the brain as well. And that pineal gland is going to release a melatonin. So you're kind of you're kind of developing a cycle um, of norepinephrine release at a certain time each night. So that's why by 10, 11, 12 at night, you're going to get tired. And, uh, and then your pineal gland is going to release melatonin, which promotes sleep. So um, I kind of listed everything out here. Uh, let's move on to some clinical correlates. So uh, I just have two here, and I'm really not going to go into them too deep. Uh, maybe I'll make some more videos. That kind of explore each of these. Um, right now, I was talking about sleep, so I thought it'd be a good idea just to, you know, give the basics for each of these. So let's start with insomnia. Uh, insomnia is pretty much just a difficulty in starting sleep and staying asleep. Um, it, that's that's about all it is. It it can be primary, uh, primary meaning kind of idiopathic, not due to anything else, or it could be secondary. And there's a lot of secondary causes of insomnia. Um, drugs, caffeine, for example, uh, alcohol excess, um, a whole bunch of psychiatric drugs. Drugs can can cause insomnia, difficulty with sleep, uh, hormones as well, a lot of psychiatric um, issues such as anxiety or stress. Um, those can cause a secondary form of insomnia. Um, also, as you get older, uh, some of the risk factors for for insomnia are age. So, you know, anybody 60, 70 years old um, is at a higher risk for developing an insomnia. Also, if the more stressed you are, like I said, can cause a secondary form of insomnia. And then finally, a jet lag. Uh, if you're a traveler, it'll mess up with your circadian rhythm. Um, so your, your circadian rhythm is off and you can get uh, a form of insomnia. And then uh, lastly, we'll talk about narcolepsy. Um, this is... I don't know if you've seen videos on YouTube of those fainting goats. Um, those those fainting goats when they're startled, um, I'd really recommend YouTube. It's a great video, but uh, that's a form of cataplexy. So they don't really have narcolepsy, but but cataplexy. And I listed here that cataplexy is simply a muscle weakness when when they're subjected to an emotional stimulus. So in the video, I think a human comes and scares the goats, and the goats just all of a sudden fall over because their muscles their muscles give out they have muscle weakness um, and that's and that's a key symptom of narcolepsy but also narcolepsy uh, is primarily driven by an excessive daytime sleep attack so let's say uh, let's say you're walking along and all of a sudden you just get an overwhelming urge of sleepiness of tiredness um, and, and that's a real concern especially when driving uh, narcoleptic patients, uh, they, I mean, depending on the stage of narcolepsy, if it's severe or mild, um, may or may not need to be restricted during driving. Uh, and then also listed down at the bottom, uh, hypnagogic versus hypnopompic hallucinations. Uh, I also kind of broke it down. Gogic means right before sleep and pompic is after sleep. So you may have uh, hallucinations right before you go to sleep or you have hallucinations right after sleep. Um, and then finally, it's like a REM-like onset uh, for narcolepsy. All right, if, uh, if you liked this video, please hit like or hit comment. Or if you have any questions, go ahead and leave a comment, and uh, I'll get back to you as soon as possible. Thanks.